Okay, so let's get on with uh, today's uh, presentation then. We'll say we did on sprinkler hazard category. So this is going to be um, across the uh, industrial and commercial uh, standard 12845 and the residential standards as well. So starting um, as I have done with some of my other presentations with a sort of a, a disclaimer. Well, well, actually, this kind of disclaimer is actually from the standard itself rather than from me. Uh, so I've, I've picked out a, a few statements here which are in um, BSEN 12845, which are, are kind of pointing at the fact that, you know, really every system should be designed uh, on, on its own merits, if you like. So let, let's just read through these. The hazard class to which the sprinkler system is to be designed shall be determined before the design work is, is begun. Okay, so, so that one's kind of common sense, really, is the fact that uh, dis deciding the hazard category of the um, the project, uh, of the building, of the application is you know one of the first things that needs to be um, needs to be decided and kind of written down and agreed. The the sprinkler designer uh, can't design until he knows what the category is and uh, certainly in, in terms of quotation uh, of works you know a lot of the, um, the the cost of the sprinkler system is going to be down to well you know what, what standard are we designing it to is it for life safety yes or no um, you know what what pipe materials do you want uh, what kind of sprinkler heads do you want and you know what is the hazard category you know there's lots of questions need to be answered before any kind of um, design or, or, or quotation work can be done and the, the hazard category is one of those things. Uh, next one down, the classification depends on the occupancy and the fire load. Examples of occupancies are given in Annex A. Okay, so again th that's kind of common sense. So, so fire load um, is a big part of dis determining the, the hazard category. Um, so for example storage comes into that quite a lot. Um, particularly with the kind of industrial applications, are, are you are you storing a lots of a lots of goods? Because if you are, then you've got a high fire load. You've got you know a lot of stuff uh, in your building, uh, which is is either likely to be that the cause of the fire, or if not, it is likely to catch fire. Um, and, and, and burn if, if there's a, a fire that starts elsewhere then obviously all of that that storage stuff that you've got is likely to go up uh, and obviously that that depends on kind of what it is and how it's been stored um, but often it, it's cardboard boxes in racking so again that's going to really increase uh, the fire load uh, on the other end of the scale uh, maybe like a, a prison for example um, has got um, very low fire load you know everything's metal and concrete um, a lot of the time they, you know, there's, there's, there's very little really to, to catch fire in a prison I suppose outside of the, the laundry room perhaps um, but then also it depends on the occupancy so okay so what kind of people um, are in the building um, so is, is it is it a like a, um, is it a large warehouse where really there's only like five people in the whole place. Um, you know, we've got lots of kind of robots and storage. So the fire load is ho but high, but the occupancy is low. Um, or, you know, do you have vulnerable people? You know, is it a care home, for example, in which case the occupancy, not only if you've got lots of people there, um, but those people are likely to be um, lower in, in, in terms of the mobility stakes. You know, they're, they're going to have... Um, wheelchairs, um, zimmer frames, walking sticks, you know, that they're going to take longer to evacuate the building um, and therefore again the occupancy comes comes into play. Um, examples of occupancies are given in Annex A. So again that, that's an important point that the Annex A of 12845 gives examples of um, hazard classifications. Now often they are used and often they are kind of correct um, but you know, it is it is good to point out they are examples only. Um, and yeah, in the start of Annex A again, it, it it's it, it's showing you that they're a list of minimum hazard classifications. So although they're saying they're examples, on the other hand, they're also saying that these are minimum hazard classifications. I.e., you can move them up a category. You shouldn't really be moving them down. Although again, you know, anything is possible as long as uh, as long as everyone agrees with with what you're doing. 
So you have um, AHJs, authorities having jurisdiction. You've got various stakeholders in the project. Um, and and you, know, you can have fire engineers, of course, on board uh, to bring their knowledge and understanding of, of fire. Um, and you know, say you, you can design something to, to suit that building in particular. But most of the time, you know, we, we choose a suitable hazard category uh, and go with that. Um, and here are some definitions, again, which are under BSEN 12845 of what light hazard, ordinary hazard and high hazard means. High hazard, if you don't know, is split into two different um, types. We've got high hazard process and high hazard storage. Um, they're pretty, pretty uh, self-explanatory, really. So is it the case of it's what you're doing um, that is the, the high hazard bit, or is it the storage aspect? And, and in some cases, you, you've got a bit of both. Um, I know that um, you know where I work at Project Fire. You know we, we've got assembly areas, so you know we are doing processes, and we've also got the, the stored finished goods as well. So we, again, we've got a bit of both in there. Um, not that our our um, factory is high hazard because it isn't. Um, but like I say, you, you can have a bit of both. But it's a case of okay, is it is it the process? Are you doing welding? You know, hot works. Do you have machines that are kind of running hot, you know, doing things, or, or is it a storage risk, i.e. you've got a load of stuff and you, you're storing it close together um, in, say, in racks or, or bays, etc. Um, so that there are two different types of, of high hazard groups. Um, so all of these um, sort of definitions and all these categories are a way of, of standardizing sprinklers. As I said at the start, you know, um, you, you could argue that every single building should be designed from scratch um, and, you know, all of this can be sort of calculated and, and decided, you know, what exactly the, um, the sort of specification should be. Um, but obviously that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, um, and so it's a lot easier to work with some defined categories. Um, is it perfect? No. Um, but what you will find is that everything is kind of over engineered, it's over specified. Uh, everything has got a sort of a safety margin to it. So um, at, at some point in the past, there would have been lots of, of kind of testing, um, obviously collecting results from real fires, um, real sprinkler activations. And that the, these figures would have been Sort of roughly calculated, and then you know they'd have added 10%, 20%, or whatever. So you know we, we've got the convenience of having the categories, and say as a result of that um, convenience, we then have to kind of add a, a safety margin to it, um, which say you know it, it, it works extremely well. Um, in my previous presentations, I've looked at um, statistics for automatic fire sprinkler systems. We, you know, we know they are very reliable, and uh, you know they really do a, an excellent job. Um, so, you know, I've, I've got no evidence at all that these categories aren't good. Uh, you know, they aren't sort of good and safe to use. Um, so, yeah, a few things to, to point out in here. Uh, well, one thing in particular really is is ordinary hazard. So. The vast majority of projects which I get involved in are ordinary hazard. Um, that's because um, a lot of the the, um, the products that Project Fire make and supply are for life safety buildings, and life safety buildings um, are all ordinary hazard buildings. Um, that's because you know light hazard doesn't really exist anymore. I mean, yeah, it's in the standard, and, and yeah, you know, you, you can argue um, that, that what you've got maybe is light hazard, but for me, no, if, if you've got, you know, carpets and computers and, you know, little bits of, of server rooms and things like that, you've got, you know, lots of furniture, then the chances are it's going to be ordinary hazard. You know, you, you've got to work quite hard um, to kind of convince um, somebody that, that your building really is light hazard. So, so the light hazard kind of have gone anyway, and you can't have life safety and high hazard. Makes sense, doesn't it? Um, you know, if, if it's high hazard, it's not going to be a, a public area. Um, it's not going to be somewhere where you know, the members of the public are kind of coming in and out. So 
like uh, say life safety equals ordinary hazard um uh, and say so that the, the, the there's another thing to point out here is is storage so if you've got any kind of storage at all really then it should be ordinary hazard group three at um that's the only ordinary hazard group which allows for uh, some storage and yeah, I'm not going to go into massive details there, but it just just needs something coming to bear in mind um, So that the main kind of thing um, which the hazard category does is it um, specifies the discharge density It also um, affects the the um, sprinkler head layouts uh, minimum distances maximum distances from walls I went through that in a previous presentation uh, could it have been last week? That's bad, isn't it? I can't remember. Um, I think it was last week we looked at um, sprinkler head layouts. If it wasn't last week, it was a week before. So yeah, I went through that then. Um, this is the discharge densities again, which we went through in that presentation. So it's no real surprise that as the hazard increases, the discharge density increases, which means there's more water being discharged per meter squared um, as the you know the more that the fire load and the hazard uh, increases so we've got from light hazard 2.25 millimeters per minute all the way up to you know the maximum high hazard storage 30 liters sorry 30 millimeters per minute um, so yeah it, it's it's quite a quite a swing quite a change and obviously that affects everything else in terms of the the pipe diameters in terms of the um, the frictional losses that you can that you need to allow for uh, in terms of the, the fire pump sizing uh, and obviously the size of the tank as well all plays into the discharge density so let's look at some examples um, so these are the examples taken from from annex a these aren't all the examples in the table but um, I've sort of picked picked a few out um, which I think are the kind of most relevant so you can see light hazard um, prisons is, is a possibility say because of you know, the, the, the amount of fire load that's in there. Um, offices are, are listed in the standard. Say, for me, no, because all offices now are, are full of IT stuff. Um, and therefore, for me, you know, there is an additional fire load and therefore it would be ordinary hazard. Examples of ordinary hazard group one, uh, hospitals, hotels, schools, restaurants. Uh, schools is an interesting one. Um, so yeah, schools. Uh, I, I could do sort of a whole presentation on schools, really. Um, schools uh, obviously could be OH1, uh, but if it's a secondary school, let's say it's a sort of a specialist um, science academy, um, then you know it's likely to have a lot of uh, sort of specialist equipment in there. Um, lots of uh, chemicals, for example, being stored. Um, lots of kind of laboratory equipment. Uh, and therefore, you know, really, it wouldn't be OH1 um, in all the building. It would be in some parts, but it wouldn't be in all. Um, so, yeah, so schools can be quite an interesting one. Uh, ordinary hazard group two, um, bakeries, breweries, dairies. So we've got the kind of the first um, sort of uh, industrial kind of um, risks there. Uh, car parks, museums, and then OH3, we've got... Um, as you can see, slightly more um, sort of flammable um, activities, so electronics factories, textiles. But then you also have the shopping centres. Uh, it says railway stations. Um, say so airports aren't mentioned, uh, interestingly. Um, but yeah, you know, I would say you know transport in general, uh, OH3, um, because um, railway stations and airports are really shopping centres now, aren't they? So uh, it makes sense for them to be in the same category. Uh, then there is OH4 as well, uh, cinemas and theatres. So uh, they, again, that, that makes sense to me that cinemas and theatres are, are slightly higher in, in risk because you've got a lot of people sort of crammed together in, in, in quite a small area. Obviously, um, with COVID, you know, that's not uh, not good for, for that reason as well, um, rather than just um, fire protection. Uh, film and TV production studios. I suspect that's a little bit outdated now. I suspect that that's still down to um, the kind of the celluloid film um, being very, very flammable. I suspect that, that nowadays, you know, with everything being digital, I imagine that, you know, you could argue that for that to go down a bit. Uh, alcohol distilleries and exhibition halls. 
Uh, moving on to the high hazard groups then. So we've got some um, processes here. Um, I haven't gone through storage um, because you see that that's a kind of subject in itself really. It doesn't really matter what you're doing. It's it just a case of you know what are you storing and how are you storing it. It will 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 tell you the the uh, high hazard storage category. Uh, so yeah, examples here: um, refrigerator factories, injection molding, so things to do with plastics. Um, high hazard process group two: um, woods, uh, paints, varnishes, etc. Uh, high hazard process group three: vehicle tire factories, and then fireworks factory would be high hazard process group four. Makes sense. Okay, let's let's switch switch track now and look at um, residential and domestic. So first of all, I have here uh, 9251. So again, just a reminder, this is the uh, 2014, which is the, it is currently the latest edition, although we uh, we know that there's a, a new standard coming soon. But for the moment, uh, this standard is split into three categories, and you can see uh, this is basically found in, in Table 1 of 9251, uh, Category 1, 2, and 3. Um, so um, some things are split into more than one category. Um, so yeah, blocks of flats appear in category one and two, but arguably they could also be in category three uh, if you've got um, vulnerable residents um, in your blocks of flats, or you know that there's, there's kind of some kind of other reason uh, to switch it to category three. Uh, then obviously you can do that. Category one, individual family dwelling. Um, again, I think some some common sense seems to be applied to that. Um, you know, if if your individual dwelling is Buckingham Palace, uh, then I would suggest that you know category one would not be uh, the, the best um, place for that that to be. Uh, but yeah, the average kind of house uh, would fit into category one, uh, and then a, an individual flat. So that that is looking at the fact that it is just the one flat you are protecting, so or multiple flats, but where each one is taken completely separately, uh, category one. Uh, HMOs, house the multiple occupancy. Um, again, for me, that's that, that's quite interesting, depending on well, how big is this HMO. Um, and again, does it have vulnerable people inside? Bed and breakfast boarding houses, blocks of flats uh, that are less than 18 metres in category one. Blocks of flats that are greater than 18 metres. And then there's again, there's a limit there in terms of maximum floor area. Um, category two. Care homes again have been split. Um, it's category two if there's 10 residents or fewer. Um, so that's quite a small care home, isn't it? Um, anything larger than 10 residents will be category three. Uh, and then uh, underneath it, it, um, it gives this considerations for increasing category, possibly into BSEN 12845. Okay, so this is a grey area. You know, this is this is something that um, you know contractors and consultants uh, and say other interested parties you know do struggle with because there isn't a sort of a definitive answer to this sort of thing. Um, so, for example, if you've got commercial letting, so if you've got a mixed use residential building, of which these are very common these days. Um, then it is a consideration for increasing the category, possibly into 12845. Um, the, the, the latest, um, the European standard 16925 actually gives some quite good information in terms of mixed use, and we'll look at that another time. Uh, yet, um, large car parks, bin stores, plant rooms, etc., may need to be increased on the category. Uh, vulnerable residents, yep. And um, a, a fire strategy, including protecting common areas. So all of those, say, you know, are, are, are listed as, as, as kind of options for increasing the category. It doesn't specifically say what to or you know how to kind of go about that. But there's also an annex in the back of, of 9251 which gives some um, sort of additional measures you can put in place, including monitoring, uh, include of uh, stop valves, including additional fire pumps. Um, Increasing the the duration, for example. So again, it's all optional, which is which is a problem. Um, I, I feel, but you know, there are details there. If you do want to kind of increase the um, resilience of the sprint system, uh, then there are lots of options there. But as I say, they are options. 
Uh, once you've decided what category it belongs to, then you apply it to Kate Table 2, which tells you the minimum discharge density. The number of design sprinklers, so that's the number of heads that you are allowing to operate at one time. Um, obviously, if you design it for just one head in operation, um, other heads will operate um, if the fire is, is, gets bigger and, and the heat um, output gets bigger. Um, but it's only designed to operate to one, two, three, or four heads under 9251, so up to a maximum of four heads. Uh, and again, that, that determines uh, the flow rate and the, um, the size of the power of the pump and the size of the tank. But as I say, you know, it, again, we looked at statistics in the past. The vast majority of cases, one head is, is sufficient. Um, if not one head, then two heads. You know, when you get start getting to three and four heads, you know, it is very, very rare. But you know, that that's the kind of the limitation that we're placing on the design. And then we've got the minimum duration on the right there. This is 16925. Um, we we don't have category one, two, and three. Oh no, no, no. We've got we've got type one, type two, and type three. Now, again, just a reminder. Again, I mentioned this before. These are taken from the national annex at the back of uh, 16925, which is different to the table, which is actually part of the main standard. So my, uh, as far as I know, that you know that, that's what you should do. If you're in the UK, you should be uh, looking to the national annex uh, rather than taking the figures from the table itself. I'm having a quick check to see if there's any questions. No, okay. Um, so yeah, again, we've got uh, Again, list of uh, different occupancies there. Um, the, the main difference uh, from 9251 to 6095 is the, the height of the blocks of flats. So um, a block of flats up to four storeys or 80 metres in height with a maximum total floor area of 2,400. So again, using kind of similar figures to, to 9251 is a type one. And then that's it. Okay, so if, if you've got a block of flats over 18 metres, then, you know, it is not covered under 16925. Um, under 9251, it's up to 45 metres. Again, it gives you a kind of a grey statement about the fact that you may want to consider um, enhancements or switching to 12845 above 45 metres. Um, again, I think that the new 9251 standard covers this um, in terms of high rise residential. And the same as before, you put the system type into this table here, it gives you a discharge density, number of design sprinkler heads, and the minimum duration. Again, very similar to 9251. Um, this is uh, hopefully quite helpful. This is like a little kind of cheat sheet, really. Um, uh, I might, uh, in, in the future, I may well kind of redo this. Um, I'll probably wait for the new 9251 standard to come out, uh, and then I can add uh, 16925 and the new 9251. Um, so you've got all, all of that kind of information uh, together. But this is showing you information such as the minimum operating pressure of the head. So again, half a bar under 9251. The minimum operating pressure varies. Um, depending on which has a category it is. Minimum discharge density, number of heads operating. So uh, under, under residential, we talk about number of heads. Under 12845, we talk about the AMAO, the maximum, sorry, assumed maximum area of operation. So again, it's, it's an area rather than number of heads. Obviously, you, you, can, you can translate one into the other, um, either by doing a simple calculation to the maximum um, spacing uh, of heads um, or and sort of minusing a few. But yeah, it's just a case of if, if you packed a lot of heads into a small area, i.e. if your design um, spacing is low, let's say it's, it's 10 square meters rather than 12, then obviously you're gonna get more heads into the same area than you would do otherwise. So uh, you know, that, that, that's why they kind of played it safe by talking about an area rather than by number of heads. Uh, minimum water storage. Again, th th this is um, taken from um, this kind of table that, that's in the standard. So you know, it will be calculated for, for each job um, if it's FHC. Um, 
but yeah, that, that's that's a guidance uh, in terms of the, the amount of, of water that you're likely to need uh, for these sorts of of, uh, of occupancies. So yeah, again, um, if you think that table is useful, um, then yeah, by all means, uh, steal it. Um, it'll be on on YouTube, um, so you can you can screenshot it from there if if you want, uh, or yeah, contact me. I'm happy to to send it on to you uh, if that's of interest. So in simple terms, in general, the higher the hazard category, the higher the discharge density. So more water is being discharged. The larger the AMAO, the, so the larger area we're allowing, so that the larger the fire area we're allowing for, and so that might be number of sprinkler heads or it might be um, in terms of actual um, area, but yet yeah, we, we're allowing for larger fires. The larger the sprinkler K factor, so in order to achieve this discharge density, we, we generally increase the number, the, sorry, increase the, the K factor of the sprinkler heads. The smaller the uh, maximum design spacing, um, so again, that there's more heads packed into the same area. The more water discharges out of each head, yep, to meet the discharge density. The larger diameter pipework is required, because again, we, we want to move more water. Um, to, to supply the, these heads and uh, the discharge density, so we need larger diameter pipe work. Um, you know, not, not massively, but a little bit. Uh, the larger the stored water requirements, again, because there's more water coming out, so we need to store more water to meet the uh, duration. The greater the liability required, again, so the higher the hazard category, the more backups and more equipment we need, the more checks we need to do. Um, because you know, arguably, it's kind of it, it's more important, if you like, because the the, the higher the, the risk category is, is gone up, uh, and the higher the duration of water supply required in minutes. So again, for light hazard, it, it's 30 minutes. Ordinary hazard, 60 minutes, and high hazard, it's 90 minutes. And for residential, or domestic, it's either 10 minutes or 30 minutes currently. Okay, so yeah, as I say, that was uh, that was more towards the kind of time frame, although I'm still nearly uh, still nearly gone half an hour. So uh, yeah, thanks again for listening. Um, so any, any comments or, or questions, uh, do drop them into the, the chat now, uh, or send me an email at sprinklertalk at projectfire.co.uk. Uh, next week we're going to be looking at residential sprinklers part two. Um, so if you haven't already seen Residential Sprinklers Part 1, uh, then you can find that on, on our YouTube channel. Um, so just search for, for Project Fire uh, Sprinkler Talk on, uh, on YouTube and it, it'll pop up and you, you can find that. Um, just to say that uh, I'm on holiday next week. Uh, woohoo! So uh, there will be um, Residential Sprinklers Part 2 next week. Uh, just the only difference will be it's pre-recorded. So I'm going to record it tomorrow. Um, and then it'll be uploaded um, onto YouTube, but also it will be it will be streamed on Blue Jeans same time at the same same method of getting on here. Everything is exactly the same. You probably won't even notice. You probably forget that it's not live. Um, so the only difference really is I won't be able to respond to questions because it's been recorded. So that that's that's the only difference. Okay. So thanks so much for listening and uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll see you next week. Bye bye.